everyone. Minnesota Senate Jobs and Economic Growth Co uh, Finance and Policy Committee uh, is now uh, called to order. Everyone, just so I can mention this, because I often say this, just so everyone has a really good sense as to how I like for things to, to go. Um, you see the bill order. I may change those bill orders just in case someone's not here. To the testifiers, you are only given two minutes per testimony. The only one who can go beyond that will be the, the Senate author, bill author. Everyone else is two minutes. So here's what I advise individuals to do. Don't repeat what your, your, your other friend has said because then that chews into your two minutes. And I time it on top of that. So once your time is up, I will kindly, with a smile, say thank you for that testimony. And if you have any additional comments or issues that you want to present to the committee, you can certainly submit that information in writing and I will certainly circulate it to everyone. The last thing that I'll say, the reason why I do that is because we have a number of, uh, of uh, bills and we have a number of testifiers and I like to be fair and equitable to everyone. I, I don't want it to be like my bill should go longer than someone else's because I'm the chief author of that bill. No, everyone is important, everyone's testimony is important and we like to thoroughly um, consider each and every uh, uh, bill that comes our way. So with that being said, Thank you again, thank you members, and there is a quorum. Oh, really? That's what you just said. All right, so uh, I am going to call up, um, we're, we're gonna actually go to Senate file 1528, that's Senator Hur. Senator Hur, we're gonna take you first, and I'm gonna ask the, the a worthy uh, Vice Chair, Senator Muhammad, to come and take the chair, because they just told me now, instead of my, bill being presented in 45 minutes. They want me to come up right now in another committee. So Senator Muhammad will take the chair, but Senator Hur, as you come up, you'll be able to give uh, some opening statements. And we also like Enrique Rol Robolido, who's the Director of Career Pathways to join you, and uh, Jafaru, who's an intern. Is the intern with us? Mr. Chairman. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Jafaru uh, could not attend today. Okay, no problem. Thank you so much. And then Ethan, is Ethan with us? Uh, he uh, is not here at the time. Okay, no problem. So we will proceed forward. And Senator Muhammad, if you will come over, and Senator Hur, if you will start your testimony, that that would be great. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, uh, Chair Champion, and then Chair also Chair Muhammad, um, presiding and members of the job, uh, economic, Jobs and Economic Development Committee. I would like to thank the opportunity to present Senate File 1528 today. This Senate File 1528 renews the work for the appropriation of $300,000 a year uh, that the, y of, uh, the YMCA of the North had received in the last biennium. The Y is the largest youth employer in our state through camps, through our camps, child care, aquatic, youth development programs, and more. Previous workforce appropriation had used the Wild Career Pathway Program to provide jobs and career readiness training and internship program serving age 14 to 24. The Wild of the North is deeply committed to equity and inclusion. To that end, this appropriation has focused on partnering with youth from the underserved communities to connect them with a pathway to career in high demand fields. Fund were also used for program staffing and youth internship wages as well as other expense to address barrier to employment, such as transportation. I respectfully request that the bill get considered for inclusion in the job omnibus bill I have my testifier here today to talk about the great thing that the Y of the North does for our wonderful state of Minnesota. So with me, as I already introduced, uh, is Mr. Enrique uh, Rebolado, Rebol sorry, I'm a little tongue twist here. Uh, you may want to state your name for the record and 
Thank you, Senator Hurt. Enrique, will you tell us how to say your last name, state your name for the record, and then begin your testimony? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, my name is Enrique Rabolledo, and I'm the director of the Career Pathways Program for Wire the North. Awesome, you can begin your testimony, thank you. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I am here to talk about the Career Pathways Program for the Y of the North uh, that serves uh, youth who have been um, underserved or systemically faced uh, barriers to employment ages 14 to 24 years of age. Uh, the program consists of a three-prong approach that we offer. First prong is the internship or the job, the workforce um, opportunity. Uh, we do about 100 hours worth of um, work that we offer uh, these interns. And the work can vary from working at our um, front desk in our membership engagement, working with uh, child care, uh, summer programs, youth work. Um, and so we provide them with the 100 hours. We also provide, our second prong is our professional development sessions, which offer uh, the youth um, workforce skills development. Um, those include uh, soft skills or 21st skills uh, building. We also do financial literacy most of the time. Um, when you come to us, it's the first time uh, they're dealing uh, with money, so we want to make sure that they're financially literate um, to some degree. And then the last uh, op thing that we do for um, professional development is career exploration. So we do talk about the different careers that are out there. Uh, we use the ONED um, survey that's provided by the Department of Labor to kind of gauge their interest. And then af off of that, we offer them um, the different paths that are um, out there for certain careers. Um, and then the last uh, prong for our program is coaching and mentorship. We do provide each of our interns a coach or mentor that they can go to. Uh, this coach or mentor is usually another youth worker uh, within our association. And so they're there to answer any questions they may have that uh, they just are having a tough time at work, how to navigate that, even if they just wanna talk about life. That's what they're there for. Um, so that's what we offer with the Career Pathways uh, program. Awesome. Thank you, Enrique. Um, Ethan has joined us. If you want to state your name for the record and begin your testimony, that would be great. Yeah. My name is Ethan Bali Kalaba, and I'm a student who's been in the Career Pathways internship system for about three years now. I remember I first joined when I was 14, and when I joined, I was looking for something that would help, like, bolster my skills, like, not only as a leader, but as someone who wants to learn how to be an adult, like how to properly grow up. And instead of like just graduating from high school and having no idea what to do, I found like the Career Pathways internship. And through it, I was able to learn like a few of these skills like leadership, how to work with others, learning more about like your personality and about yourself so you can like work better with others. And I really liked it because not only like with like the skills that they taught us, but they were able, like, due to their funding and due to their connections, they were able to place us within different, different jobs, jobs like aquatics, jobs like working with kids, or even, like, really high-level IT jobs, which I got to do with the YMCA. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Ethan. Um, I believe that's it for the testifiers. Members, any questions or comments for Senator Herzbill? Seeing none, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Oh, thank you, members and Madam Chair. Okay, so next we have uh, Senator McQuaid's bill, um, which is Senate File 1261. Senator McQuaid, if you want to begin your testimony, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, before you, you have Senate File 1261. Um, Senate File 1261 is uh, a bill that would uh, codify the recommendations made by the Advisory Task Force on Employment and Retention of Employees with Disabilities. Minnesota is the largest employer in our state, and we have a pretty terrible track record of hiring and retaining people with disabilities in our employment. So this bill would codify Governor Dayton's Executive Order 1414 and, and Governor Walz's Executive Order of 1915. It improves the 
implementation and, exec and execution, excuse me, of the Connect 700 program. It provides direction to MMB regarding disability policies and employment. It codifies and clarifies the roles and responsibilities of ADA coordinators in our state agencies. It standardizes the training of hiring managers and ADA coordinators across all state agencies, and it establishes a data collection and reporting structure on the advancement of employees with disabilities. I really wanna thank the task force for putting this um, report together and the recommendations together. This was a tremendous undertaking. Um, the Council um, for Minnesotans with Disabilities has been just incre an incredible council leading with policies that will support Minnesotans with disabilities and telling us how we can be a better employer. And I really look forward to having a conversation about this bill. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, may I turn it over to my testifier. Yes, thank you, Senator McQuaid. Uh, Trevor Turner, if you can state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Trevor Turner, and I am the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, the Minnesota Council on Disability is leading efforts to increase disability representation in the Minnesota state government workforce. And as Senator McQuaid said, uh, Senate File 1261 adopts the recommendations made by the Advisory Task Force for the Employment and Retention of Employees with Disabilities. Um, we believe that with more disability representation in our state enterprise workforce, especially those in leadership positions, will lead to better decisions being made around state disability policies. Uh, Senate File 1261 was first conceptualized in 2014 when it was reported that the percentage of state employees who self-identified as having a disability declined from approximately 10% in 1999 to less than 4% in 2013. Governor Dayton issued an executive order that provided direction and guidance to state agencies to hire more people with disabilities, and by 2019, the number of employees with disabilities grew to 7%. However, Minnesotans with disabilities represent 20 to 25% of the state, so they're still underrepresented. Governor Wald reissued the executive order in 2019, and the percentage of state employees grew to 10.3% by 2022. The success of the executive orders is one of the reasons that the Advisory Task Force on Employment and Retention of Employees with Disabilities uh, recommended that they be codified into state statute. Uh, the task force was created in 2019 by a bipartisan le legislation and deliberated for two years, releasing their report in February of 2021. Uh, Minnesotans often face in, uh, difficult or even insurmountable barriers in finding and maintaining employment, and the state of Minnesota is no exception. Unfortunately, Minnesota does not have adequate disability representation in its workforce, and far too often, policies that significantly impact Minnesotans with disabilities are decided by a small group of non-disabled policymakers. Minnesotans with disabilities need not only our voices to be heard, but a seat at the state governing table. This is a nothing about us without us bill, which would require more consultation with people with disabilities and those who are disability employment experts. This bill supports all people with disabilities, regardless if they are born that way, become disabled later in life, or are disabled due to serving in the armed forces. Increasing disability employment and retention among the state government workforce creates a pipeline of future leaders and policymakers in our state enterprise system. When Minnesotans with disabilities make decisions in our uh, make decisions in our agencies, the disability community in our state will be better represented and better served by our state government. And I'd like to thank Senator May Quaid for carrying this bill, and thank you for your, your support this committee. Thank you. I'm Dan here for questions. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, members, questions for Senator May Quaid, May Quaid, or the testifier? Seeing none. Senator Putnam moves to pass Senate File 1261 and refer it to the Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed? All right. Motion prevails. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Committee. Okay, so next we have Senator Weber, who will um, be talking about Senate File 1479 today. And members, just for your awareness, this bill will be going to taxes. You can go ahead and begin your testimony, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you today Senate File 1479. Uh, it is the Southwestern Minnesota Workforce Development Scholarship Pilot Program and uh, resulting appropriation for that. 
Uh, I'd also have, Madam Chair, the author's amendment, A1 amendment. Mr. Chair, I'd offer Senator Weber's A1 amendment. Uh, the A1 amendment has been offered. Uh, any discussion on the A1 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The amendment is adopted. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the bill as amended, uh, basically what this bill does is establishes definitions for the purpose of creating a pilot program in southwest Minnesota around scholarships designed to grow the local workforce. Many of our communities uh, struggle and our employers struggle to find the trained people that they need, uh, particularly in areas such as uh, uh, automobile mechanics, um, you know, or, or electrician, the trades, electricians, plumbers, uh, carpenters, and even in the uh, medical fields. And so this program is designed to work through DEED uh, with a, a workforce development relationship that already exists, and which is an efficient way to model this particular pilot. Uh, funds appropriated by the legislature would be awarded to the Southwest Initiative Foundation, who would in turn administer the program. And this pro bill also defines the seven Minnesota West colleges that scholarships could be awarded to. Uh, program eligibility includes high demand occupations, associate degree, diploma, or certificate programs as defined by the local workforce development board. The foundation and Minnesota West shall establish the application process and other guidelines, something they are both willing to do. And the scholarship recipients, Mr. Chair, and members must be enrolled in one of the identified programs offered at a Minnesota West college, adhere to any local employer program requirements, commit to three years of full-time employment with a local employer, and in the event a recipient drops out, the scholarship converts to a loan by the foundation. It requires the foundation in Minnesota West to develop relationships with local employers uh, to maximize the effect of public funds, and the amendment provides a tax credit benefit to participating employers. An annual report is required to be provided by the foundation back to the legislative committees of jurisdiction. And finally, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, there's an appropriation of $700,000 to deed for an award to the Southwest Initiative Foundation. At this point, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, two mayors from Southwest Minnesota, the Mayor Laverne, Pat Boston, the Mayor of Marshall, Bob Burns, and uh, they are prepared to testify next. Thank you so much, and thank you for your opening uh, uh, comments. We will go to Mayor Baston, who's with the city of Laverne. Uh, that will, will is joining us by Zoom. Uh, what I'd like for you to do is to introduce yourself for the record and who you represent and give us your two minutes of testimony. Thank you so much. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Mayor Pat Boston. I represent the city of Laverne. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members, and thank you for the opportunity to testify in full support of Senate File 1479. And thank you to Senator Weber for carrying this great piece of legislation. The history of the Southwest Minnesota Council of Mayors uh, started in 2020. A group of us mayors started meeting and we concentrated on our border communities for the initial membership of mayors, Jackson, Minnesota, Worthington, Laverne, Pipestone, Canby, Granite Falls, and Marshall because of the college. We collaborated on one issue that has continually affected us all. Our biggest issue for many of us was the loss of our workforce to South Dakota with the Build Dakota Scholarship Program. That fund paid 100% of students in their schooling in exchange for con work contract with their future South Dakota employer for three to five years. And also Iowa has similar programs. We initially identified the shortage of critical jobs in all of our communities, like Mayor, uh, like uh, Senator Weber said, diesel mechanic, auto mechanic, electrician, HVAC, plumbing, auto body, mental health, CNAs, CDL drivers, and many other careers. We all felt the vacuum that the Built Dakota Scholarship Fund was leaving in all of our communities since 2015. Our young workforces continue to leave all of our communities to get their two-year degrees paid for in exchange for working for the employer that sponsored them in South Dakota and the Build Dakota Scholarship Fund. Once these future workforce community members leave, our communities or leave our communities to go to school, they finish their degrees in South Dakota. 
they purchase a home in South Dakota and eventually find that significant other, which pretty much seals the deal, only never to return back to our Southwest Minnesota communities for our workforce in critical trades jobs or any other jobs for that matter. In my community of Laverne, I've personally visited the, with five local employers that are paying 100% of the tuition for their future employers in order to just be on the same playing level as South Dakota employers who benefit immensely from the Build Dakota Scholarship Program. And Mayor, I strongly Mayor, ask you for your so support of this workforce up. jobs bill. And, and Mr. Mayor, if you'd be so kind to wrap up and and, and and I'll invite you to, if you have some additional testimony outside of what you're about to wrap up saying, please feel free to, to uh, provide it to us. Uh, go ahead, your, your, your closing comments. Absolutely. I just want to thank the uh, committee on their uh, accepting this bill to be heard. And I would strongly ask for your support of this workforce jobs bill for Southwest Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions for Mayor Baston? Seeing none, we'll go to Mayor Burns with the city of Marshall. If you'll be so kind as to identify yourself for the record and, uh, uh, and, and who you're with and go forward with your, your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Bob Burns. I'm mayor of the city of Marshall, I, uh, a position I've held for the past 31 years. I'm also uh, today representing in this testimony the Southwest Minnesota Council of Mayors as uh, Mayor Boston has described that group. So thank you for allowing me to present. I will be brief. I won't repeat what my friend Mayor Boston has talked about. The uh, But Southwest Minnesota is facing a critical shortage of workers to fill available jobs. And if we aren't able to fill those available jobs, we will not only uh, lose the employers, employees, but we'll also lose the employers to our neighboring state. Uh, our region has a very low unemployment rate and we are experiencing out migration and we are a region of the state that is in a decline in population. Our young people, um, uh, due to the aggressive recruitment from our neighboring states that Mayor Boston described, are moving to the west and to the south. Uh, so the workforce development program will focus on those critical jobs that are in our region that are identified by the Southwest Work Workforce Council and the Regional Workforce Council. And we'll also utilize the capacity that is available at Southwest Minnesota uh, West Community and Technical Colleges to educate and train and retain that workforce to fill the jobs that we do need. So the Southwest Minnesota Council of Mayors uh, urges support of this proposal to retain our workforce and our employers reduce our out-migration of our young people and uh, help the, our region to thrive. So thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Burns. We, we sincerely appreciate you being with us. Any questions for the Mayor of Marshall? Seeing none, thank you to the two mayors. We really appreciate you. So stay on with us just in case a committee member develops a question later. Now we'll go to Scott uh, Marquardt, who's the president of the Southwest Initiative Foundation. Uh, welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and who you're with, uh, and give us your two minutes of testimony. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Scott Marquardt. I'm president of Southwest Initiative Foundation. We serve the 18 counties and two native nations of Southwest Minnesota. Our region borders I-1 South Dakota, and many of my communities have three-digit populations. Um, Southwest Initiative Foundation has been a trusted partner with the state of Minnesota since our inception in 1986 and we're grateful to be named in this bill as the intermediary and grateful for the relationship we have with DEED, uh, the team with um, Interim Commissioner McKinnon and the whole crew over at DEED. Um, we're grateful for the trust and partnership you've placed in us uh, over the decades we have in growing our region's economy in creating communities where all businesses and communities can prosper. Uh, most recently, our collaboration with DEED helped deploy millions of dollars to thousands of small businesses as our entrepreneurs work tirelessly to navigate the unknowns and the impacts of the pandemic. Small business emergency loans, small business relief grants, loan guarantees, Main Street COVID relief grants, and today the Main Street Economic Revitalization Program uh, reiterates that we have the staff, the systems, the deployment partners, the local connections, and most importantly, the knowledge on the street of our local communities to deploy this capital 
if trusted in us uh, to advance an equitable approach to workforce retention and development, inclusive community engagement in ensuring that this money reach, reaches uh, populations that are historically marginalized and underserved. Uh, we also have years of experience in managing hundreds of scholarships throughout our region and this will align beautifully with our Career Pathways efforts. So again, we're grateful for the consideration of being named. Uh, we believe we have the systems to uh, put this money to work on the street right away and deliver a great ROI. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Any questions for Mr. Marquardt? Seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony. Now we're going to Eric Simonson, uh, who's with the Southwest, Mayor's, uh, Southwest Minnesota Mayor's Council. Uh, Mr. Uh, Simonson, I, I almost called you Senator, so, so <laughs> Eric Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think in the interest of time, I can't say anything that hasn't been said already, but I'd be standing for questions if there were any, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Any questions for any of the testifiers or anything about the proposal that is before you? Seeing none, we will, uh, it is my understanding that this bill, uh, Senator Weber, it needs to go to taxes. Is that right? That is correct, sir. All right. So, uh, Anyone wants to move this bill? All right, it, 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 uh, uh, Senator Nelson uh, moves that Senate File 1479 be passed as amended and we refer to the Committee on Taxes. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Thank you so Thank very you, much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Have a great day. We are now going to Senate File uh, 1583, Senator Muhammad. And while Senator Muhammad is coming to the testifier's table, she has a testifier, uh, Dr. Joe uh, jo Hobot. Hobot, I should know that, President and CEO of, of American Indian OIC. So if you'd be so kind, and let her sit in the middle, that would be great. Thank you for being here, as usual. Uh, Senator Muhammad, now you're on that side of the table. Thank you for all that you were doing earlier. So now, Senator Ma Muhammad, to your Senate file 1583, uh, give us your opening testimony, anything that you want us to know, and then we'll introduce your testifier. Senator Muhammad. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, before you is Senate File 1583, which appropriates a total of million dollars over two years in workforce development funds to the American Indian Opportunities and Industrialization Center to support workforce development programming. I support this bill because I've seen firsthand what it means to have your ambitions limited by society that has determined what you can and cannot be on the basis of the skin of your color, of the color of your skin or your status. Um, and I'm here because I've seen that education can open doors for, uh, for communities that have been systematically denied the opportunities that many of us have come to take for granted. Um, and because we tell people to follow their dreams, but you can only dream for, uh, but you can only dream of what you can imagine. And depending on where you where you come from, or who you are, your imagination can be limited. That's why I'm I'm proud to support this bill, and I will ask your support for it. And with me is the CEO, Dr. Jim. Thank you, Senator Muhammad. Uh, to the testifier, Dr. Hobart. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Senate JEGFP committee, my name is Dr. Joe Hobart. I serve as the president and CEO of the American Indian OIC. Haumatakiwape, hihani la shinwashte omachiape, shunkmanatu se tokia hiai. My, uh, that is me greeting you in my family's language of Unkpapa Lakota. My family are citizens of the Standing Rock Nation. I've been serving as the President and CEO of the American Indian OIC for nine years now, and I've been at the organization for 17. Uh, Senate File 1583 represents critical keystone funding for our participants that are not only pursuing a secondary educational credential, typically in the form of a GED, but they're also provided services and career contextualized training. So simultaneously, while they're getting upskilled in market viable skill sets that we offer in our training programs, they're also simultaneously pursuing their GED 
Or additionally, in the adult basic education, those that have their GED may be looking to enroll into post-secondary uh, schools or are already enrolled, and they can receive remedial tutoring, one-on-one -on -one tutoring in the GED program as well, while they're concurrently pursuing their career trainings. The career trainings that we offer at American Indian OIC run the gamut from IT services, our computer support specialists, to uh, healthcare, uh, medical office assistants, electronic healthcare, billing, coding, and, and whatnot. We even have some direct healthcare, such as phlebotomy. And of course, we have manufacturing. Uh, we, we have OSHA certifications, other stackable credentials uh, that are absolutely critical for refinement of the candidate. Along with the trainings, they're also provided with a full complement of employment services, uh, not only candidate refinement, but our job developers create connections to employers that are looking for immediate placement. As you well know, the pandemic was uh, particularly harsh for our communities. Uh, we are the lagging indicator, so while we're seeing some really good economic uh, indicators for the overall state of Minnesota, our unemployment rate within the Native American community remains about three times that of the state of Minnesota, as well as almost triple the size of those not considered in the labor force. So this represents critical keystone funding. Uh, it is not the standalone funding that we have. It also is braided with other sources that come in that our organization uh, seeks through the philanthropic community, as well as from the federal government. Uh, when combined and braided together. This appropriation allows for the payment of the training, the curriculum, and the employment services, while the other funding resources helps with additional barrier reduction, such as child care provisions, rental assistance, transportation assistance, uh, you name it, work, work clothes and what have you. Uh, we're looking for a renewal of this as we see an uptick in our participant rates uh, since we've been emerging from the pandemic. Uh, and we're anticipating, actually, the numbers are suggesting a surge is on the horizon as people are feeling more comfortable to get back into the workplace. Doctor. With, well, you my time at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hobart. Um, and I know I interrupt you, so was there anything, one last little thing that you were going to say? Because we have to keep moving. Yes. Uh, the last thing is that uh, you may or may not know many of our participants co-locate with their tribal homelands in, back in northern Minnesota. So oftentimes they receive these critical trainings and then get employment back in outstate Minnesota or vice versa. They come to the cities to seek employment uh, and, and get this critical training to add to the workforce. So this investment really is an investment both in the metro area as well as the outstate areas. Thank, Thank you, you, doctor. Appreciate that. And again, as I've made the offer to others, if there's additional information that you want us to know, feel free to submit that to us in writing, and I'll make sure that it's circulated to our committee. Doctor, uh, perhaps you can answer this question. Is, uh, I know that there is a line item that we looked at the other day where there's money for OICs. Correct. And are you receiving any of those o o OIC numbers, and is it for the same thing that you're asking the committee to support today? Dr. We do Hobart. receive those resources. It is not necessarily for the same thing. These resources are put for those folks that are just seeking career trainings, and so some of our career trainings are, are financed through the OIC's appropriation. We, uh, after 40 years' experience, we, we know how to stretch the dollar as far as it can go, and so these, each of these resources are utilized to their best of their ability in specific ways. And, and Dr. Hobart, is this, a, a, are you asking for an increase? Because it looks like uh, before that you were getting some money from the Workforce Development Fund, but, but it seems like in 22-23 that it was, was uh, $712,000 per year if my uh, sheet is correct. Dr. Hobart. Mr. Chair, you are correct. We are seeking an increase. As some of the data that we shared with you that are in your packets, we've already seen a sizable increase in training participants. In the conclusion of the first year of the previous appropriation, we had over 130 training participants. In the first six months of this year, we've had 177. So we look to eclipse last year's number. And then we have a way of looking at inquiries through our websites that people who begin the pre-enrollment process, we've already seen an increase there that surpasses both the previous each month. It surpassed each of the previous months and has over tripled what we've seen in the year prior. So this is what I alluded to as this, this beginning of this surge of people coming in looking for trainings and employment opportunities. And Dr. Hobart, uh, how many people did you all serve with the past money that, that was allocated? And with that, and, and with that consideration, what, what will you see as the return on investment in the event that we provide additional resources uh, as outlined in this uh, Senate file 1583? Dr. Hobart. Sure. So in the, at the 1.5 mark, we had about 207 participants that received uh, trainings through this appropriation. We anticipate a, a, about doubling of this number. Is what, that's why we're seeking the additional increases. Uh, so we look to see at least 400 people come through our training circuits and also get employment placement uh, with, with this area. Uh, did I hit the question correctly there, Absolutely. Mr. Chair? Uh, Dr. Hobart, uh, of that 207 that you have identified, how many of those are placed and at what wage, wage number? Dr. Dr. Hobart. 
So ultimately, we have about 200, and, uh, you see 164 in the first year and then 94 after that. So just about 170 have been placed in, in new positions. The median wage is $18.82, uh, which may seem small. We have higher hopes, but for many within our community, this is transformative. This is the ability for them to then go ahead and seek independent living, provision food and meals and, and whatnot for their children as well. Uh, any other questions for Dr. Hobart? Uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and you asked a, a couple of my questions. The only one I have left is, um, I, I believe you might have a bonding project as well. And I wondered um, if you, I think it's in our packet today, but I assume you're going to have this in front of the bonding committee. Correct, uh, Sen uh, Mr. Hobart. Chair, Senator Nelson. Uh, that was uh, that is a separate enterprise. We are seeking a bonding project in, in connection with other 15 Native American organizations uh, for new facilities, state-of-the-art facilities, which will further amplify the the impact that we have for for our students and for those seeking workforce development training. I think it's a glitch that it got included with your packets, but we're not uh, ashamed of it. We're proud to to advertise that as as much as we can, including a rally that'll be occurring here at the Capitol on the 21st of of March. Uh, any Thank other you. questions? for Dr. Hobart. Thank you so much, Doctor. I know some people like to say it's a glitch. I say it's just enlightening for <laughs> us to be able to know what else is out there. So thank you so much. Uh, 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 but thank you for your work. Senator Muhammad, any final questions or any final statements before we lay this bill over for, for possible inclusion? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think they do really good work and I think it's clear and uh, just ask for your support. All right, with that being said, Senate File 1583 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you so very much, and thank you for your testimony. Opalatanka. Senator Muhammad, you are going to stay with us because it looks like you have the Office of New Americans as well. Uh, so Senator Muhammad is getting ready for Senate File 360, and while she's getting prepared, we're looking for Michelle uh, Rivero. if you would join uh, the capable one at the table. And uh, Mr. Muhammad, who's, who's the Assistant Commissioner of Deed, if you would join her at the table as well. And I know that we have one additional person that's online. Uh, Senator Ma Muhammad, is my understanding, once you give your opening statements and once the presentation is done and questions are answered, there would be a motion for this particular uh, bill to be referred to, passed from here, and we referred to state and local governments and, um, and veterans. Now, be, before that, would you like for us to look at the A1, or would you like to give your opening statements first? Senator Muhammad. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to offer the A1 amendment. The A1 amendment has been offered by Senator Muhammad. Uh, any questions on the A1 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. All those opposed, say no. The A1 amendment has been adopted. Senator Muhammad, to your uh, to the to Senate file number 360 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, sent before you, Senate file 360, which establishes the Office of New Americans with Indeed. The Office of New Americans would be a dedicated office to serve new immigrants and refugees, addressing the unique challenges facing those population, creating access in economic and workforce development services, and providing interstate agency coordination. There are, number, there are already a number of existing councils and nonprofits that do good work when it comes to serving immigrants and refugees. The ONA does not repeat any of the functions of these councils or, nor, or, or nonprofits. Instead, it complements them, creating a space for them to work collaboratively. At a time when businesses are experiencing workforce shortages, we should do everything we can to help new Americans participate in our communities and gain access to the opportunities they need to get into the workforce. Access to good jobs with, with competitive benefits that can support a family are sparse for some immigrants. Many families come here in search of a better life only to find that they have to work three part-time jobs just to make ends meet. Some immigrants who were, who were doctors, lawyers, engineers in their countries of, of origin arrive in the U.S. only to find that their training and certification means nothing here. Members, that's not right. Now, please do not conflate my critique of our immigration system with a lack of gratitude. I'm grateful for the roof over my head. I'm also grateful for the people and the resources my family had, that, had made, had, that made it possible to skateboard and establish a life here. 
the reason why I'm here today is because I believe that every immigrant family in Minnesota should be able to have those same resources and opportunities as my family had. That's what the ONA will do. Members, Minnesota is at its best when we welcome new, new Americans from around the world and help them to thrive. We have a rich history of welcoming immigrants and refugees, but we can and should do better, and this is our chance to do better. And I have a few testifiers with me, Chair. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Thank you for the opening statements. And we'll go to Michelle Rivero, who's the Director of Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs with the City of Minneapolis. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record, who you with, and give us your two minutes of testimony. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Champion and members of the committee. My name is Michelle Rivero. I'm the Director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for the City of Minneapolis, or OIRA an office that is dedicated to immigrant and refugee inclusion for the city's non-US born and new to country population, which is estimated at about 63,000 residents. Ms. Riv R Rivera, yes. can you get closer to the mic because we know you have great things to say, but we're not able to hear it. Thank you. Is this better? Yes. That's much better. Please Thank continue. You. Thank you. I can attest to the critical importance of offices at the municipal and state level dedicated to advancing policies and initiatives that empower non-US born residents to achieve lives of dignity, opportunity, and economic prosperity in our city and state. It is estimated that over 450,000 current residents of Minnesota were born outside the United States, comprising close to 9% of the population of the state. When the position of Assistant Commissioner for Immigrant and Refugee Affairs within the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development was created in 2020, this was an important step in strengthening our state's immigrant and refugee inclusion infrastructure. Former AC uh, Anissa Hajimumin and current AC Abdiwahab Mohammed have worked to develop partnerships across the state, including with residents, community-based organizations, employers, entrepreneurs, chambers of commerce, as well as municipal, county, and state-level governmental staff. These connections have supported work in areas such as language access, equitable communication of funding opportunities, including in the area of entrepreneurial activity, and initiatives focused on addressing current workforce shortages, including in the healthcare industry. Building on this work through a fully staffed Office of New Americans, like similar offices in states as diverse as Michigan, Colorado, Maryland, and Virginia, would advance efforts towards economic success and civic participation and address challenges for which there is not yet a comprehensive statewide strategy. All Minnesota residents benefit from a robust welcoming infrastructure, one that spurs economic and employment opportunity, civic engagement, and equitable access to services, information, and programs. And Ms. Uh, Vero, if you could wrap up, because your time has exceeded. Thank you very much. Now is a critical time for an office like this. Our continued success as a state, including our ability to staff the many open jobs that currently go unfilled, is dependent upon the strength, ingenuity, and talent of non-U.S. born residents here. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide testimony. And Ms. Rivero, it looks like the, you with the city of Minneapolis and, there's a, and you're the director of, of Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. How long have you been in that position and how long has the city of Minneapolis had such an office? Thank you so much for the question, um, Chair Champion. I am the inaugural director of the office. The office has been in existence since July of 2018. July of? 2018, 2018. sorry. 2018, all right. Thank you so much. And now we have uh, any questions for Ms. Uh, Rivero. Seeing none, we are going on to Abdi Wahad uh, Muhammad, and I hope I didn't mess up your name because with every ounce of due respect. I'm trying to make sure I, I pronounce it correctly. So you're the Assistant Commissioner of Deed. So state your name for the record and correct me, of course. And then, uh, and then who, who you're with and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, my name is Abdi Wahab Mohammed. I am the Assistant Commissioner for Immigrant and Refugee Affairs at the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Um, I'm here to provide uh, general support for uh, SF360, a bill that creates uh, the Office of New Americans. Um, the governor has a recommendation also that includes a proposal to create this office. And um, so this bill is a standalone bill establishing owner. And uh, there has been some additional tweaks. I wanted to mention that uh, to the bill, but there, 
they're not reflected here, but you know, the governor's budget will, will reflect more of the tweaks, and uh, I'm confident that we'll sort out the differences between the, the different bills as we support the creation uh, of this office when the committee hears that. <coughs> um, Mr. Chair, members, uh, the research by the New American Economy shows that immigrants and refugees are vital to the Minnesota future growth. Immigrants own over 19,000 small businesses in the state, earning about $17.5 billion in household income and generating over 411 um, million in business income and contributing to about 4.8 billion in federal and state local taxes. <clears throat> it shows that also foreign-born residents have jumped by 27% in the Twin Cities and 37% in Greater Minnesota. Uh, communities all over the state are uh, welcoming immigrants, and, but there's more that we can do to welcome uh, new, Amer new, new Americans. According to real-time talent, Minnesota is losing about $5.1 billion annually by not utilizing immigrant and refugee talents, uh, what uh, Senator Mohammed has talked about uh, credentialing. Um, so this bill will lead, um, or the office that we, will, we hope to create with this office, will, with, with this bill will lead in creating and implementing a statewide strategy to support uh, immigrant and refugee affairs. And it will uh, mostly do three things. It will create improved access uh, to services um, uh, the state, in the state government. It will reduce barriers to employment opportunities, and it will pr improve connection between employers and immigrant job seekers. Uh, thank you, Senator Mohammed, for uh, carrying this bill, and I will stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, Mr. Mohammed, it looks like there's an appropriation that you're asking for $1.5 million each fiscal year. Are you asking for this to be uh, placed in the base, Mr. Mohammed? Mr. Chair, um, yes. And with that request, um, how many FTEs uh, are, are you looking to add on in, in order to justify this, this request? Thank you, Mr. Chair. M Mr. Uh, Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, currently, we only have one full-time staff, which is me, and we're hoping to have a, a minimum of uh, three. So we, we're hoping to have a program manager uh, and, and, and executive aide and uh, any other relevant um, as advised by the uh, uh, spots. And Mr. Mohammed, it looks like a, a part of your mission is to work within the, uh, the agencies or the state agencies uh, what, uh, how much work is going to also be with making connections with outside uh, folks who are, no, who are not a part of the, st the state government? Mr. Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so far, we have done uh, quite some, some work with the communities. We have connected over 1,000 immigrants and refugee callers seeking information about business and employment. We conducted cultural orientations, and we have con connected over 300 employees uh, to employ. So uh, this is to say that we're, we will do a lot of uh, community organization work. We will work with the ethnic councils. We will work with um, um, organizations that are outside the state agencies as well. And last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Mohammed, e even though this is at the Office of New Americans, um, are, uh, do you see that there are going to be unique issues amongst uh, the uh, various new new Americans, and how do you anticipate this office dealing with that in real time? Mr. Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> as, as we continue to do research on into serving best the communities uh, that, that are uh, joining our, our, our state, um, we, we hope to have some uh, dollars allocated for research to figure out what, uh, what, what other innovative ways we can serve and, and the issues that arise. And Mr. Mohammed, there are a number of ethnic groups, uh, ethnic councils that are supposed to do a lot of this work. And what you're asking for is more than what they get on any uh, 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 yearly basis. So help me reconcile those two thoughts. Mr. Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the office currently has uh, done some work um, connecting not just with the state. We have a network of states all over the country. So we have done a lot. Our scoop has, has become much bigger. And, and working with other states, as well as working with um, all the councils and all the 17 state agencies together. So we, we are hoping to do a lot of work and, and have permanent employees that will, will, will carry this mission. We also want to focus on language access. We want to focus on credentialing. Uh, those are the services that will need, will need uh, more of the dollars that we're asking for. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Mohammed uh, or any of the testifiers? Uh, Senator Nelson. Uh, m Mr. Chair, I, I just wanted to um, kind of further your comments. Those were my questions as well, which is the 
overlap with our current um, our, th our current councils. I'm, I'm just finishing my 10th year on the Minnesota Council for Latino Affairs. And many of the things that you're asking for are things that our councils already do. And Mr. Chair, you might remember a few years ago, there was a discussion about should there be one council, maybe called the New Americans or something else, which would um, be broader uh, and certainly, we know that there are significant immigration issues, which a, a lot we can't really handle at this state level. But um, so I guess that's my question, Mr. Chair, too, is this might can, can uh, move forward, is that it might be duplicative of what's already being done. And also, as you noted, the great discrepancy in the funding levels between the current councils and, and this uh, New Americans Council. So I have some questions still, but appreciate the opportunity to, to discuss what that overlap might be. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, appreciate your questions and Senator Nelson's comments because this was, this was uh, a big topic of discussion during last year's conference committee report where we had the same concern, Senator Nelson, that as the governor had described the Office of New Americans, there seemed to be a lot of overlap. And quite honestly, um, interesting that we had to create an entirely new agency to help the governor manage 11 of his own agencies as it relates to this topic, where it certainly seems like the governor, if could, by virtue of being the the head of these age of, of all of these agencies, all of the all of the commissioners report to him, um, could in fact do that. Uh, could in fact do that coordination on their own at the executive level. You know, I appreciate I appreciate the testifiers' comments about you know how much economic impact you know Im immigrants and refugees can have, which is exactly why we need to do a better job of assimilation and integration into our society. But I find it interesting that we're talking about 750000 a year for three employees, three six-figure employees uh, to be hired. I didn't have the, uh, uh, the fiscal note in my packet today. I, I looked it up online. Um, but Mr. Chair, that seems like an awful lot, especially when last year in the conference committee report, we had agreed to about $350,000 a year to accomplish these tasks. Um, I'm not quite sure where we're seeing a doubling of the effort that's, that's needed compared to what we discussed last year. But um, I, think it's, I think it's important that we uh, uh, also look to the governor and his current resources to, if this is important to him, that he make it a priority, not a legislative priority, but his priority to get his own uh, agencies working together and collaborating um, without our help. Um, let Mr. me also Chair. say this. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe, uh, Senator Pratt, that something needs to be done, and I can see the importance of such an office. I just want to always make sure that we're being thoughtful about how we get it done, right? Mm -hmm. And so I believe that there is a need and that we need to f figure it out. Uh, I think Senator Muhammad uh, has put forth a, an important piece of policy in order for us to wrestle with this important notion. Uh, and I think it's also important for us to recognize that sometimes when you're in the executive position that, that you, rec you see that there are things that can be done to improve what is necessary. And so I, I do thank you for that. And it, any additional questions before we go on? Uh, let's see, S uh, Senator Pratt, and then we'll go back to Senator Nelson. Well, and thank you, Mr. Chair, which is why we, you know, work to give 350000 recognizing that there were additional resources needed. Um, but we did it without creating an entirely new agency. And, and I think that's an approach that, that should be considered even further and um, you know Senator Muhammad I appreciate what you're bringing and we saw this last year and and we know this was a, a, a proposal uh, last biennium it's just I also want to make sure that 
the committee understands that there was a lot of work done in collaboration with the House to make sure that uh, we came to a, a reconciliation that was uh, not only uh, not only improved uh, the lives and the and the uh, integration of, of refugees and, and immigrants in, into our society and into our workforce, uh, but also did it in a more cost-effective way um, without adding as much bureaucracy as I believe that, that the original proposal, and, and this is very similar to that original proposal, so I know it well. Um, and I would, I would just offer that we, uh, we try to, to get a little more creative and, and um, maybe look at some other opportunities um, that were in last year's uh, conference committee report. That's all. Uh, thank you. And before I go to Senator Nelson, one of the things that I think is important for us to keep in mind as we are entertaining um, uh, the various proposals is one is last year there was a non, uh, like any year there's a lot of negotiation that goes on in order to see what we can do with, with, within the constraints that we've been presented. Two, I do recognize that even with the ethnic councils that we have not resourced them enough in order to do the work that they need to do. So it's sort of like uh, when you're in certain families that you learn how to stretch those dollars even though it doesn't mean that you don't need more, sometimes you don't eat as much as you need to eat because you, you recognize that you need more. So, uh, so I think that this is twofold, that we should think about the councils and what they really need, right, as opposed to what we give them. Those are two different things, right? Uh, so I just want us to be really mindful of those two things. Senator Nelson, before we get closing comments from us, uh, Senator Muhammad. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Muhammad, I agree with the, the needs that you've identified here, and I really liked what I heard as far as what the New Americans, uh, I, I don't know if it's called a council or not, but the New Americans, the Office of the New Americans uh, had uh, in mind. Uh, one note, just to note, typically in the Senate, uh, we, we don't put in purpose statements in the legislation itself. The legislation kind of speaks for itself. So we might not need a purpose statement in the legislation, but I appreciate uh, the purpose. And my point is, I do, and I also agree with you, Mr. Chair, that we probably haven't uh, done what we needed to do with the ethnic councils. But what I can't see yet today is how this is how this would work together. I think we would be uh, remiss if we just funded another New Americans Council without doing our due diligence in working with the existing councils and seeing how could we work, how could they work together and not be uh, duplicating efforts and very much coordinating uh, together on on how to move forward. So that's and, and I would. Uh, as if this moves forward or as it moves forward, before I could um, feel confident in casting any type of vote, uh, I would want to hear from the councils. I, I'd want to hear from the councils. And I noticed that uh, Henry uh, Jimenez is one of our testifiers today, and he was the executive director on the Minnesota Council of Latino Affairs at some point. I, I do recall working with him, and it would be interesting. Uh, he's not in that position right now, but it would be good to hear from our councils in how this may help or may not, and how, how to work together on this. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, Senator uh, Nelson, thank, thank you for that. And as we look at this policy, we will have the ethnic councils weigh in because I do think that there are ways for this, this, this office to work in conjunction and in a much more impactful way with the office that's being proposed. Can I go to your other testifier that I forgot to go to, Senator Muhammad? We do have one more that's on Zoom. Enrique Blanco, who, who is the Operations Director with Latino Economic Development Center. Um, are you with us? And, and if you please give us your two minutes of uh, testimony before we go to Senator Muhammad. Buenas tardes, Mr. Chair, members of the Jobs Economic Development Committee. <clears throat> My name is Enrique Blanco, and I'm the Director of Operations at LEDC. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. <clears throat> I'm here to testify in support of Senate File 360. LEDC was founded 20 years ago to level the financial playing field for Latino entrepreneurs of Minnesota. LEDC is a community development financial institution loan fund whose mission is to empower immigrant Latino small business owners with limited access to capital through small business loans and technical assistance 
that get them closer to achieve their dreams of entrepreneurship. Through micro and small business loans, LADC provides a hand up to Latino small business owners so they have a chance to succeed. However, we could not do this work alone. Partnering with the Department of Employment and Economic Development is essential to create a support system and network for our immigrant Latino entrepreneurs. The Office of New Americans will help increase economic opportunity by helping to reduce barriers and coordinate language access to state initiatives and agencies. We currently see this as a large barrier as we have to translate state programs to our clients. We support the Office of New Americans at DEED because we have successfully partnered with DEED in advancing access to capital, technical assistance, and workforce development for BIPOC entrepreneurs. Senate File 360 will be in fact impactful to our organization as well as to our community by having a liaison that works on bridging all opportunities to give new Americans the best opportunities possible to succeed in their businesses. Thank you for your time today. We urge you to support Senate File 360, and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Any questions of the testifier? All right, seeing none, Senator Muhammad, I know you had your hand up, and so I'm going to let you go forward, and if you have any closing comments as well. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, members, for your comments and some of the concerns that you have. We have been working with the ethnic councils, and they've had some say on language on the bill. As far as the fiscal note, you know, well, first of all, at a time where we have a historic workforce shortage, I think that we need to engage people who are coming to this country, and, and especially in our state, and, and this is the best way we can do that, one of the best ways that we can do that. And, you know, we talk about the amount of money that immigrants bring to our state. And we're questioning whether we should give back to them $750,000, $1.5, or $350,000. Um, I... These are the moments why I look at this job and I often think we can do better. And that's why I've introduced this bill because I don't even think 1.5 is enough. If it was up to me, I'd be introducing more. Um, but that's why we're gonna work, continue to work together collaboratively to talk about the fiscal note on it and, and, and make sure that it's something that is serving immigrants across the state and not just few. So thank you. So Senator Muhammad moves that Senate File 360 as amended uh, uh, be passed as amended and we refer to the Committee on State and Local uh, Governments and Veterans. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Muhammad. We are now going to Senate File 1836, Senator Jasinski. This is on a... Uh, Owatonna and Steele County's workforce training appropriation. Uh, there's Jenny uh, Reitman, who's the executive director of workforce development. If you'll join at the table, as along with Phil Sales, uh, who's with human resource manager at Viacom and vice chair of the Southeast Minnesota Workforce Development Board. Now that's a long <laughs> title there. Uh, um, so, so Senator Jasinski, if you'd be so kind as give us opening statements, and then we'll go to each of your testifiers who will pre present two minutes of testimony. Senator Jasinski, welcome back to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, thank you for having me here again today. Uh, those of you may be familiar with this program, actually in 2018, the uh, Otana Workforce Center was forced to close due to non-funding. Uh, so we worked several years, uh, and you folks, uh, many of you on the committee helped uh, with this. So we received funding in fiscal years 21 and, tw I'm sorry, 22 and 23 to reopen the facility. Uh, so we're here today to ask for funding to continue the uh, workforce development uh, center in Oton and Steele County for the fiscal years 24 and 25. Uh, since being reopened, it's, it's true, uh, shown to be a really integral factor in what's happening in Otana. Otana has a large, diverse uh, manufacturing uh, group of companies as well as a, a diverse group of workforce. Uh, so what this uh, program helps do is match these uh, uh, people to the jobs that they're needed and upgrade the, the, ta the workforce uh, in the community. It's very, very important. Uh, the Otana Chamber has been very uh, vocal in, in how important this is in the community. Uh, so with that, in a matter of time, I'll turn it over to my testifiers, but uh, hope you uh, consider uh, Senate File 1835. It's very important for Oton and Steel County. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Senator Jasinski, and thank you for correcting me because because my my committee administrator said I said 1836, and I didn't mean 1836. I mean 1835. So thank you so much. So Jenny uh, uh, Reitman, uh, who's the executive director of Workforce Development Inc., Inc. It, welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record, who you with, and pro and provide your two minutes of testimony. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for this opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Ginny Rittman and I'm the Executive Director for Workforce Development Inc., or WDI. WDI is a nonprofit organization that provides employment and training services for a 10-county area in southeast Minnesota. Today I represent the Workforce Development Board of Steele County residents, career seekers, local businesses, and community partners. We were thrilled to reopen our Steele County Workforce Development Office in 2021, and we hope to keep these services available to the critical needs in our region. The Oatana Workforce Center closed its doors in the public, to the public in April of 18. Oatana was the only community in Minnesota with a population of over 20,000 that didn't have a career force center. Due to shrinking public funding resources, we were forced to close. Knowing that the employers in Steele County are paying into this important workforce development tax, our businesses and community partners were incredibly disappointed. In 2021, we were fortunate to receive a direct appropriation to reopen our doors, which we did later that year. Since that time, in just over a year's time, we've served over 300 career seekers and over 200 employers, helping employers find talent and providing training and support services to help career seekers access opportunities. Our cost per participant served is $1,328. We have numerous matching and braiding funding streams, yet this appropriation is critical for us to continue these services to the residents of Steele County. As you can see from your handout, we have diverse, unique, and impactful programs that are truly moving the needle to addressing the workforce challenges of our region. And we were able to stand these up, sign on key stakeholders, develop and provide this programming incredibly quickly after receiving our allocation. I look forward to you hearing from two employers and a young adult participant to share these impactful programs. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and committee members, along with Senator Jasinski as our champion in this effort. Thank you. I like the fact that he is a champion. That is true. <laughs> I, no pun intended. So, uh, <laughs> Philip Sales, uh, who's with Human Resource Manager with Viacon and Vice Chair of the Southeast Minnesota Workforce Development Board. If you state your name for the record and who you're with and give us your two minutes of testimony. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, my name is Phil Sales, and I work for Viacon in Owatonna, and I'd like to offer my testimony as, uh, as an employer. Um, we are, we're a glass fabricator employing about 1,200 people. A few of our projects include producing the windows for the U.S. Bank Stadium uh, and the Freedom Tower in New York. Uh, thank you for allowing me, and this building also. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of Senate File uh, 1835. Uh, the Workforce Center provides value to employers like Viracon in a number of ways. It gives us a point of contact for any external event which impacts our workforce planning, whether that be hiring dislocated workers, students, or the general community, uh, grant opportunities, training partnerships. Uh, they can prov provide information that, that we just don't have in-house. For example, we're exploring ways to introduce youth to manufacturing, uh, but we're, we're concerned about keeping the students safe. Um, the folks at the Workforce Center were able to explain best practices for employing students, and they were able to connect us with another manufacturer who has a long history of safely employing students. For some positions, we recruit individuals from around the state and the country. Uh, more times than not, they come with a significant other that wants a job. Uh, if we don't have a position for the spouse, I refer them to the Workforce Center because I know they'll be taken care of there. Uh, Steele County has a great community of manufacturers, but we're, we're all unique. Uh, we have different shifts, overtime requirements, physical demands, uh, culture, and pay. The career planners at the Workforce Center, uh, they know this and they share this information with the job seekers, which leads to better outcome for everyone. Thank you for your continued support of the Owatonna Workforce Center. Thank you. Any questions for any one of these testifiers before we go to two others. Uh, Senator H Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it's great to see uh, Jenny Rittman here doing great things with workforce development. I just have one question that uh, she might be able to answer. Uh, and I know several years ago, I think I was perhaps a freshman in the Senate then, maybe about 2012, we passed uh, legislation uh, that co-located the uh, Workforce Development Center 
with the RCTC campus. It's been just so highly successful. You could probably speak to that, just that great synergy there. And I'm afraid I don't know Owatonna well enough to know if there is a uh, higher ed facility uh, that in the area, and if so, is that something that you can work together? It might not be exactly co-locate, but we know that's been very successful. So maybe you could just speak to that, please. Ms. Reitman. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Nelson. So we actually are co-located in four of the counties that we serve. Uh, in Steele County, we were prior uh, to us closing, we were co-located out on the campus. Uh, but recently, we decided to move elsewhere, just um, basically due to um, um, location for our career seekers and location for our businesses. The college camp and camp campus excuse me, is kind of far away from a lot of where our career seekers are uh, located, so we did choose a different location, um, but we do work very, very closely with um, both uh, institutions that serve the Owatonna and Steele County area. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, Senator one Nelson. size does not fit all, but thanks for sharing that with me. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now go to Matt Beck and Dale Tracy if they would come up and join us at the table. And we will go to Matt Beck, who's the Still County Young Adult Participant. Give us a welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and who you're with uh, and provide your two minutes of testimony. Again, welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair, thank you for this time. I'm Matthew Beck. I graduated from the Otana High School. And talk a little more in that uh, mic there. Mr. Chair, thank you for this time. I'm Matthew Beck. I graduated from the Owatonna High School last year and am currently working full-time as a welder at Advanced Coil Technology in Owatonna. I'm going to briefly tell you how workforce development in Steele County has made an impact in my life. I knew I was interested in a hands-on job after high school. I liked working on cars and I liked, welding. I liked the welding class I took, but I was lost on what to do to make those interests into a job. In the fall of my senior year, a career planner through the Steele Co-Works program with workforce development her name was Megan. She came into one of my classes and she said she can help connect students to employers and learn about careers. She connected me with the diesel mechanic where I did a paid work experience and I learned it wasn't the career path for me. I knew I was still interested in welding, so I decided to explore that further. And Megan set me up with a tour at Advanced Coil and I later job shadowed a few of the welders. I quickly realized I wanted to work there. I was hired on through a work experience program at Workforce Development that was approved by Youth Skills Training and was paid to work at Advanced Coil and gain experience. Advanced Coil requires employees to have a welding certificate, so I toured the welding program at South Central College with Megan. She also helped me through the process of applying to the college. I was accepted into the program and my tuition was paid in full through the Advanced Manufacturing Grant. I continued to work at Advanced Coil part-time throughout college and was hired on to a full-time role after I completed my welding certificate. If it wasn't for workforce development, I wouldn't have been able to explore my career interests before committing to a career. I also wouldn't have been able to go to college without taking out loans and start a career that I can see myself staying at long term. I am 18 years old, have no college debt, enjoy my job, and I am making more money than most of my friends. I am grateful for the support I received from the Steele County Workforce Development Office and want more students to have the same opportunities that I had. I can honestly say I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for Megan and Workforce Development in Steele County. Thank you for this time and allowing me to share my story. Thank you for being here. We sincerely appreciate it. You did a great job. If you'll wait, we might have some questions for you. But I'm going to go to Dale Tracy, who's the Director of Operations and Application Engineer with Advanced Coil Technology. Welcome to the committee. Uh, identify yourself for the record, who you're with, and then uh, proceed with your two minutes of testimony. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members uh, for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Dale Tracy, and I'm the Operations Manager for Advanced Coil Technology in Owatonna. We're a small manufacturing company in southern Minnesota, and like every other company, it has been a struggle to find qualified employees. Team up, teaming up with the Steel County Workforce Development has given us the opportunity to look into other ways to recruit and spread, spread the word about what we have to offer our area young adults. One of these opportunities is the paid work experience, which has given us the opportunity to work with high school students to allow them to see different careers available to them. It gives them the opportunity to try different career paths before they must decide on their future. This program encourages employers to bring in unskilled labor and train them to be productive employees 
and hopefully making a career choice. With this program, you are teaming up an individual with a job interest to an employer with a job opening. One thing that, one thing that I have learned over the years is that if someone's excited about their job, they can be taught all they need to know. We were fortunate to be able to use this program last summer and bring on a student who was interested in a career in welding. He spent the summer with us learning welding skills as well as other duties that pertain to his career path. We encouraged him to continue his education and to get a degree in welding, which he did. When he completed his welding course, we had a position open for him and he returned to Advanced Coil as a full-time welder. Because of the success of the Paid Work Experience Program, we are seeing a growing interest in the welding field. We have people coming to us looking for welding jobs, and I know several other local companies that have benefited from workforce programs as well. Thank you for your time and support. Thank you so much. Any questions for either one of our testifiers? Let me say thank you so much uh, uh, to the young man for your testimony. We, we sincerely enjoyed you being here and, and sharing your experiences. We really do, do appreciate that. So thank you so very much. S seeing no further uh, uh, questions, I do have a couple questions. So it, so it appears, uh, Senator Jasinski, that on line 1.10, that it, that it seems that the money is directed to Steele County. But then I see that there is something for Owatonna County uh, in line 1.11. Can you kind of talk about why uh, you only uh, have Steele County on line 1.10? Uh, Mr. Chair, it's a joint project with Steele and Owatonna. I don't know the specifics. Maybe council knows the difference there, but it's a, it's a joint project together uh, working in Owatonna and Steele County. So I don't know the technical differences of why it's written that way. Maybe Ms. Fontaine knows. Ms. Fontaine. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Member Senator Jasinski, I, I'm just gonna say I did not draft this particular bill. <laughs> However, um, we could certainly add, before Steele County on line 1.10, you could certainly add Owatonna and Steele counties, if, if, if that's your preference. Um, I was just making sure that, I wanted to make sure that the money wasn't going to one county or the other, but it looks like it's going to the, um, <coughs> Workforce Development Inc., so that wouldn't really matter, but maybe um, a testifier has more information if you do or don't want that included. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Reitman. Yeah, if I may. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Owatonna is housed in Steel County. Our office is in Owatonna, but we serve all of Steel County. So there's three or four other communities that we also serve, and we have participants that, per that come to us from all those different um, towns surrounding Owatonna. But Owatonna is in Steel County, and our office is in Owatonna, but we serve the entire county. And in the event that this is uh, included in the omnibus bill, we can certainly make sure that, that, that any language would, uh, would line up and make sense. We just wanted to make sure that you were uh, clear and you helped us be clear as to what that means. Senator Jaziski, looks like you were going to say something. You say in the event or when this will be included? I'm a lawyer in the event. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Let me just say that. I any other questions for the testifier? Before we lay it over for, for possible inclusion, Senator Jaziski, you have any closing comments? Uh, nothing more than a thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. This really is an important thing uh, for Steel, uh, Steel County and Otana. It's uh, proven to be a very, very valuable asset, so uh, I'd ask your uh, support in hoping that it is included uh, in your uh, bill. So thank you very much, and I want to thank my testifiers today who did such a great job, so thank you. They really did do a great job. So with that being said, Senate File 1835, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you so very much. Before the committee now is, is Senate file 646, Senator Pratt. And Senator Pratt, it's my understanding once your testifier is finished, there's gonna be a video that you all want us to, to play, is that right? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes. As part of my introduction, I'd like to have a video. Uh, maybe before we get to the bill itself, okay. if I could offer the A-1 amendment. Uh, Senator Pratt offers the A-1 amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, you know, as working through this, I realized there was something I missed in the amendment. I'm going to throw Ms. Doyle Fontaine a, a curveball here. 
I was also hoping that we could make an amendment to the amendment um, on line 1.8 after 2024 add and 250,000 in fiscal year 2025. So this is an amendment uh, to an the amendment uh, to the amendment to the amendment. And Ms. Fontaine, will you report the amendment? The amendment to the amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, on line 1.8 after 2024, insert and $250,000 in fiscal year 2025, and delete is and insert R. All right, any questions to th that uh, amendment? Um, well, it's two things. I think we have to deal with both separately obviously so the amendment to the amendment all those in favor say aye aye all those opposed say no the amendment to the amendment is adopted and now the a1 amendment the underlining amendment any questions any discussions all those in favor of the a1 amendment say aye all those opposed say no the a1 amendment is adopted Thank now you, on to your 646 as amended senator pratt and did you want us to play the video first um, Mr. Chair, let me let me go ahead and start to introduce it, and then we'll then we'll go to the video. Senator Pratt, and I appreciate the the committee I was working off of uh, last year version. But uh, members, PTSD rates among our first responders is a topic that we see often in the news, and quite honestly, the rates uh, are are on the rise as we get better recogni at recognizing the symptoms and effects especially after decades of dismissing the disorder. Our police officers, firefighters, and paramedics see horrific scenes on the job, including severe injury and death. Yet we're just beginning to understand the effect of repeated exposure to some of these incidences. These experiences can have a detrimental impact to a first responder's personal life and the inability to perform their jobs, causing even further depression. Equine-assisted therapy is one emerging th th therapy that is showing positive results. Equine-assisted therapy is a, form, is a form of experimental treatment that has been developed in conjunction with licensed equine-assisted therapy instructors. It's interesting. As prey animals, horses tend to be sensitive to subtle changes in their environment. And quite honestly, as I think as many of us have seen firsthand, to the presence of humans. Horses have been observed as mirroring and reflecting the emotions and energy of individuals who are in their presence. They respond both to the behavior and the mood of the individuals to whom they are exposed, allowing them to almost act as biofeedback, as a biofeedback tool for, home, for those whom they're interacting. Psychologists believe that equine-assisted therapy participants have the opportunity to gain insight into their own emotions and reactions through interactions with the horse. And Mr. Chair, this is where I'd like to go ahead and play the video. Thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Um, if staff would be so kind as to tee up the video and play the video. Uh, can we start it over again so we can make sure that it's heard from the beginning?
Help is on the way, uh, Senator Pratt. Well, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, while we're Senator Pratt, while they are getting that together, is it okay for us to go to one of your testifiers that will give us a little time? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, before we do, I just wanted to, uh, since I haven't formally introduced the bill, so Senate File 646 as amended requests 250000 each fiscal year to pilot the equine-assisted therapy, to pilot equine-assisted therapy as treatment based on science and research to help first responders get their personal lives uh, in order and to re enter the workforce. Uh, this uh, one-year appropriation was in the final 22 uh, jobs bill conference committee report. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Are we ready for the uh, video now? If so, let's go forward with it. Advisors on the Backside collaborates with off-track thoroughbreds, working with veterans and first responders. My name's Todd Selner. I've been a firefighter for almost 25 years. One of the most beautiful things with Todd is that he doesn't want to be vulnerable, but he's willing to put himself in a vulnerable place. Coming here every week. Anytime you're dealing with trauma, often we don't have words to express that. Our bodies express that. These horses are so intuitive, and they pick up on things going on inside of us. The horses tend to play physically out as to what I'm feeling. I guess living vicariously through me allowed me to let it out, let it go. I wish I could explain it. I, it, I can't. I am in awe of what these thoroughbreds do. It almost sounds unbelievable, and Uh, I, I'd witnessed it myself. I had a bad call right before I came. My emotions were off kilter. The horses reacted. Whatever was going on inside me went through them. When he's watching them lose it, it's almost like they're doing it for him. He doesn't have to. Like, they, they got it. Definitely seen changes in myself. The Abijah's program absolutely would be beneficial to first responders, veterans, the support that they should get. When our stories change, we change. And we have that ability to change them. That's healing at its finest. That's not a, a Band-Aid. When you walk out of here and you're transformed, that's powerful. Thank you so much. So, Senator Pratt, would you like for me to go to your testifiers now? Please, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sally Mixon, founder, uh, would you be so kind as to state your name for the record and who you represent and give us your two minutes of testimony. And thank you for that video. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm Sally Mixon, founder of Abijah's. Um, I want to point out that in every single session, there's a licensed mental health clinician and an equine specialist. So we are truly doing psychotherapy. Um, it's just an unconventional kind of out of the box approach. Um, this model, this therapeutic model that we do has been around for many, many years, is globally um, seen as an approved approach, um, a proven approach, I should say. I've personally been doing this work for over a decade and I get to watch miracles every day. Like that's my job, it's pretty awesome. Obviously I'm biased. Um, I 
cannot tell you enough um, how many um, officers, um, police officers, firefighters, medics that we see that are coming and we don't want them to pay a thing because they're already paying everything. Um, so many are taking their own lives. And I believe that this model um, could be a source of um, helping the retention of their jobs. Like we need to start keeping them. And in order to do so, um, we want them to be healthy and productive um, as they serve the public. Um, and in order to serve the public well, they gotta be well, they gotta be healthy. Um, and as Senator Pratt pointed out, um, they see so much trauma that it's our job to really keep them healthy so they can help as many people out there as they serve our communities. Um, with that, I will turn it over to our next testifier, if that's okay. That is just fine. Angela Borchett? Yes, sir. Uh, um, state your name for the record, who you with, and correct me if I enunciated your name incorrectly. Uh, and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm Angela Borchert. I'm a I was a police officer for the city of Northfield for 11 years and with the airport police department for approximately four years. Prior to being a police officer, I was a detention deputy for Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. I'm a graduate of Winona State University with a major in both law enforcement and corrections. I'm a third generation police officer where serving my com community and helping others was a true calling. This continues to ring true. At the end of March of 2022, I knew something wasn't right. I was having trouble concentrating. I was paranoid, no short-term memory, and I was vomiting many nights when I lay down to go to sleep. I couldn't quiet my mind. The stigma of other officers finding out I was struggling was enormous. I needed help. Through different contacts and connections, I heard about Abijah's on the backside and decided to reach out. Sally called me immediately and within 36 hours I was meeting with her. She explained how the program worked and when I arrived, I was introduced to the thoroughbreds, Wave and Boxer. And because they are so intuitive, they immediately began to act out what I was feeling inside. Boxer started running, re rearing and biting Wave. Wave just took it. She moved out of his way as he overtook the ring. Wave's moves were solely dependent on Boxer's actions. With the help of Sally exploring my story that was being played out by the horses, it clicked. Boxer and Wave were physically showing me the unidentifiable, the confusion and the flooding emotions and thoughts I was consistently having that kept me from being present in the moment. There's nothing scarier than being a police officer and not being able to be in the moment. As seen, Boxer represented law enforcement in my life. He was constantly there without let up on Wave, who represented my my life outside of law enforcement. Law enforcement had overtaken my thoughts, my actions, my emotions. The continuous, never ending, what I know now as trauma, was controlling me. I've continued weekly with Abijah's. The team at Abijah's and their knowledge of working with police officers was so helpful in identifying my trauma. Because of Abijah's, I'm alive and discovering joy once again. Unfortunately, my experiences in law enforcement are common. The unhealthy and stigmatized way we police, police officers are expected to handle those experiences are common. However, having resources, having Abijah on the backside are uncommon. When they come along, we need to cultivate and support them. The amount of, of help Abijah's on the backside can provide given the opportunity is unquantifiable. Uh, $250,000 is a start but because there are so many of us who need help, I believe that 500,000 or more would save more lives and keep more cops in their career, from ending the career early. Abijah on the backside sees a need, knows how to help, needs, but needs the funding to get there. Please contribute to their continued success. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much. And let me first of all say thank you for your service as well. So we sincerely appreciate your service. Uh, any questions for the testifiers? Uh, Senator uh, Drahan. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Senator Pratt, for bringing this bill forward. Um, can you just kind of give us, and maybe I missed it, but can you give us a, a feeling for how many people you're able to work with in, in a week or a month or a year? Yeah, yeah. So uh, this... Uh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> to the testifier. I'm Ms. usually Mixon. in a barn, sir. Um, this is not my <laughs> I know, I got it. Ms. Mixon. 
Um, so we, this bill would allow us to do 1,000 sessions, and it's 50 first responders doing 20 sessions. And typically, that's what we see. Anywhere between 8 to 20 sessions, they will be good to go. Senator Joyheim, follow-up. Thank you. And, and where are you located? Uh, Ms. Mixon. We are located at Canterbury Park. So we have partnered with Canterbury Racetrack. Thank you. Any additional questions for either one of the testifiers? Seeing none, closing comments by Senator Pratt before we lay this bill over. Oh, did I forget someone? Oh, uh, Senator <laughs> Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So many tough questions. Just kidding. I just wanted to say um, my sister does this. She has therapy dogs, and they go to children's hospitals. I think this is wonderful. I love this that you're doing this. I'm glad that this bill came for the committee. Um, so it was just a, a comment full of praise, but I think um, more things like this are important, especially with the mental health crisis that we're seeing right now. So thank you. Thank you so much. Any other comments or questions for the testifier? Senator Pratt, your final comments before we leave Senate file, uh, let's see, 646 on the table as amended for well, possible you. inclusion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank my uh, co-authors, co uh, Senator Hoffman, Senator Seberger, uh, Senator Duckworth, and Senator Howe. Also members in your packets, you should have letters of support from the city of Lakeville, uh, NAMI, and the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. Um, you know, as Ms. Mixon said, this is, you know, this is not playing with horses. This is real therapy that's uh, helping our first responders overcome the trauma uh, that they've seen, that they've experienced, uh, and getting back into the workforce, which is the goal that I, I know you and I have shared over many, many years, and, and uh, I hope to see this uh, in, the, uh, in the final uh, bill. Thank you, Mr. With sure. that, Senate file number 646, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Thanks. Pratt. Now, members, we're going to our last bill, which is Senate file 1409. And Senator Muhammad will take over again, and I will go to the testifier's table. Madam Chair, members, thank you so much uh, for uh, hearing uh, Senate File 1409. Uh, I'd like to start by saying we all understand the role of fathers in the lives of children, or even parents as a whole. Too many children are growing up without the financial and emotional support of a positive, involved father. And kids raised in households without a father, believe this or not, is five times more likely to experience poverty than children in two-parent households. The Father's Project of the Goodwill Easter Seals is a national model here in Minnesota with quality partners in Rochester, St. Cloud, and I'm sure that Senator Putnam likes to hear that, Minneapolis and St. Paul, and who together have created a place where dads get the job training and parenting skills they need in order to become an essential part of raising healthy, happy, and secure children. We've also seen increases in wages, child support payments, and parenting skills are just some of the program's economic impact on families and communities. Conservative estimates uh, from the Wilder Research show a three to one return on investment. More importantly, the project brings families together, putting children first. Senate File 1409 builds on this established and successful model of supporting dads and their kids across the state of Minnesota. So here today to discuss the Father's Project, um, our guy Bowden, Bowling from Good, Goodyear Easter Seals, who I know very well, and they do a, a wonderful job with the program, but also a, a wonderful community event where fathers come out with the children. And we also have Ben Warner, who's with the Family Service Rochester. With that being said, Madam Chair, if we could start with Guy Bolden to give his two minutes of testimony, that would be great. Uh, Mr. Guy Bolden, you can state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Guy Bowling, and I'm the Senior Workforce Development Manager for the Father Project. Uh, it's a program of Goodwill Easter Seals of Minnesota. 
Um, thank you again, Senator Champion, um, <clears throat> and members of this committee for the opportunity to speak about this impactful program that equips fathers with the skills needed to help their children, their families, and our communities thrive. Good Weeks Sales of Minnesota provides customized programs to eliminate barriers to work and independence. Our Father Project have served dads for almost 25 years, uh, focusing on a combination of economic stability and work supports, parenting support, and legal justice support. Our proven model has been shared with partners in other parts of the state, including Family Service Rochester and Olmstead County, Goodwill in St. Cloud, and partners in other locations. The program is strong and positioned to meet the needs of even more dads in the coming years. Many non-custodial fathers want to be involved in the lives of their kids and their children, and their children need to develop tools and connect with a support system to be successful. Our program largely serves men of color who are low income, non-custodial, many are unemployed or underemployed with multiple barriers. Our goal is to help dads get jobs, train for better jobs, move into careers as they become positive, productive workers and parents. Recent years has been challenging for all of us, including the Fowler Project. In addition to the effects of COVID-19, we were also greatly impacted by the civil arrest, unrest of George Floyd uh, due to the, um, in 2020, uh, due to the events surrounding and following George Floyd. Our physical location was actually destroyed and during the unrest, and it also staff were furloughed and the effects of the pandemic and overall lack of funding had an impact on our program. It truly was a challenging period for the program, our staff and dads and the family we serve. And ultimately, our program has emerged, though, even stronger and even better position to support the dads who are thriving to support their kids. We have fully returned to in-person services. The Father Project has established a new location at Sabathany Community Center in South Minneapolis and establishes now services in St. Paul as well. The needs continue to be great. The last year, we've enrolled more than 275 dads in the program. Many of these men experiencing issues related to reentering society and incarceration. 75 dads were placed in employment last year as part of our strong outcomes in 2022. 75% of those dads completed our intensive 12-week parenting group. Many have increased contact with their children. I'm happy, oh actually the last thing I'll say is uh, the state appropriation will allow us to serve hundreds more fathers and help them stabilize employment. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, but first let me introduce one of our community partners This is important work, uh, Mr. Ben Warner. Good afternoon. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Bolin. Um, ben, if you want to say your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Yeah, my name is Ben Warner. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Ben Warner, and I have a great honor and privilege of being the career specialist for the Father Project with Family Service Rochester and also alumnus of this amazing program. Our organization has served dads in the greater Rochester area for over 10 years. In 2022, our program in Rochester served 65 dads. The majority of these men have struggled maintaining employment and faced barriers such as chemical health, legal troubles, child support arrears, broken relationships, lack of solid work history, and the list goes on. Even prior to entering our program, we work with the dads right away to start to examine these barriers to see how we could help navigate them back to being a great dad and a productive member of society. Our community has rallied around the Father Project we have been very fortunate to have many great partners who want to be part of the solution and see our dads succeed. There are numerous employers we work with on a daily basis that are willing to give our guys a chance, knowing that they have some barriers that they may not normally otherwise allow. We work closely with child support in order to help our dads get back on track and out of arrears. If the father project didn't exist, I may not be here today. I may not have custody of my boys. I may not be a homeowner. I might not even be a taxpayer. There's a good chance that I may still be stumbling down a dark path. Chances are I'd be a burden on society instead of a positive leader that I am today. This program isn't just a program. For many of us, it's the turning point. Involvement in the Father Project can be transformational for many of who come into our program broken and hopeless. The vast majority leave with a job, career, furthering their education, a driver's license, a GED, paying child support, paying off debt, paying off fines, being law-abiding, and mending damaged relationships with loved ones. Their children are the ones who ultimately benefit. All these positive choices that these dads are making wouldn't be possible if the Father Project um, weren't here and, the, and they didn't learn skills like these. With continued and inc increased funding, we hope that not only continue to serve dads, but to serve even more dads so that their children and our community will thrive. 
thank you for your time, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Warner, for that wonderful testimony. Members, any questions for uh, Senator Champion or his testifiers? Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, just uh, not a question, but a comment. Uh, I just want to say how great it is to hear what has happened and happening with the Father Project. I remember Mr. Guy years ago, I didn't realize it was 10 years ago, but I suppose it was, uh, that we sat at the Rochester International Event Center at a dinner table together and spoke about the Father Project and how could we get this in Rochester. And so I just really salute you, uh, Mr. Warner, of course, Senator Champion for carrying this. I'm just so pleased and, uh, you know, we need strong fathers. And um, we need things like the Father Project. You make a difference. And so I just really uh, look forward to seeing this bill as it moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator Champion, for bringing this bill. And if you haven't had a chance to visit Mr. Bowling at the, at the Father Project, I, I highly recommend you do. Um, I had the opportunity to visit him on site one time, uh, talk to a couple of their alumni. and. You know, while we're in the jobs committee and we're, and we're talking about helping these men get jobs, I thought, and Mr. Bully, maybe you want to expand on this a little bit, I thought one of the most uh, touching and impactful discussions was how these men were reconnecting with their children. And I remember, I can't remember the guy's name, but he, he was in tears talking about how he reconnected with his daughter. Um, and develop, developed a relationship that was missing in his life that that motivated him. Uh, and, and I don't know, you, I'm sure you've got hundreds of stories like that, but to me, that's what was really touching, understanding that it's not just about the job, it's about the person itself. And you have to have your personal life intact if you're gonna be successful in your professional life. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, and I'd have to. Mr. Oh, Bowling. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, I was anxious. Wait. Mr. Bowling, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think um, it's just another example of when you provide resources for men. Um, majority of the men, if not all of the men I've come in contact through 25 years of doing this work, they want to be the best men. As all, and not only that, but the best fathers they can be. And if you give them access to resources, to be there, to be in the lives of their children, and the motivation that they get as a result of it, I mean, one of the biggest things and the biggest untapped resources we have are fathers in our community. But if you get them in a position to be stabilized and there for their families, they're also the largest solution that you can have as well. So I've had the pleasure to be able to do this work for a long time for both professional and, prof and personal reasons. So I thank you, Senator Pratt allow me to be able to share this testimony. Um, Senator Champion for closing comments. Closing comments, thank you so much. You know, I think uh, the, the testifiers have been uh, spot on and just the comments around the table has been spot on. You know, just hearing about the Father's Project and knowing about it makes me think about my father. My dad uh, passed roughly seven years ago. So the same week that Prince died, my dad died. And, and but, um, uh, most people will say that, you know, being sad, and yes, uh, I wish he was here, but the impact that he's had on my life growing up has been immeasurable. And in fact, my dad never graduated from high school. And he came from the South, and he made sure that when he relocated to this great state, that he was doing everything he could to be the best father that he could be. And he would hand certain lessons down. You often heard people talk about me waking up at 3.30 each morning. That is true. I am up seven days a week at 3.30. But I remember my dad making me and my brothers get up early and said, don't sleep the day away. It's the early bird that gets the worm. And that is still something that I um, uh, uh, adhere to. And I have two sons and who are away at college. Now, I will tell you that, that they don't quite get up at 3.30. They're, they're glad that they're away at college, right? <laughs> and so I have to call them and be like, hey, what are you doing, right? Um, but I understand the impact on the family and the children, community, when we lift up parents, but also fathers in particular as well. Uh, we already know the value of mothers. You, you know, the one thing that I'll say is that my sons, even to this day, even though I can do whatever, they will always call their mother and always say, Mom, what do you think? 
I said, what about me? <laughs> right? Uh, or you see an athlete or an artist on television, and when they're thanking <laughs> someone, they're always mouthing, hi, mom. <laughs> And we don't take that away because we understand the value and the importance of mothers. But we also want to elevate the importance of a father and how he can be instrumental in the lives of his children as well. So that's what this mean, uh, is about. Thank you so very much. Madam Chair, thank you so much for, for giving me a moment just to give some closing comments. Thank you, Senator Champion. Uh, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. And with that, that concludes our business for the day. So thank you, members. Thank you. Committee's adjourned.